Welcome to the Backyard Professor videos. Um, I've got a very interesting topic that I want to share with you that actually a few people have been asking me about and I've been threatening to do a video on this anyway, so now is as good a time as any <laughs> to talk about the idea of in, in early Christianity in Paul's day, Paul essentially in some of the New Testament writings basically said women are to shut up, sit down, and not talk in church. And this is a controversial idea. Now it's an idea that the biblical scholars have discussed from time to time and the, well, with the rise of the feminist movement and their interpretations of the scriptures and so on and so forth, they have also indicated the ridiculous misogynist attitude of the early patriarchal Christians against women. And Paul has been vehemently reviled and uh, dismissed and uh, he's just a woman hater and he's a jerk and he's a clown and so on and so forth. The scholarship is very interesting on this subject, and I want to share some of the scholarship with you. Now, I have my fair share of difficulties with the Apostle Paul, and I'm going to defend him here in some respects. Now, before you turn the video off, let me explain. <laughs> the, the churches have done something very interesting over the course of the last, say, well, within my lifetime, 60 years. Many of the pastors, Bart Ehrman describes this in one of his books, he's written so many books, he's so wonderful to read, uh, where the ministers, when they go get their pastor certificates, or when they get their master's degree, or their PhDs in New Testament studies, uh, the Bible and archaeology, the ancient Near East, whatever subject they're studying, to try to give them some background credibility to be able to preach the word to their congregations. They have studied the higher criticism. Now, the word criticism, you know, when you, when you study textual criticism or redaction criticism, when you study the New Testament scholarly way of studying the scripture. The word criticism does not mean to refute, to find a way to make it false. Criticism is basically the very careful, detailed, critical study of comparisons of passages between the Gospels. Yeah. Matthew versus Mark. How did Matthew word this as opposed to Mark? Why did John say this about Jesus when none of the other three Gospels have anything like that? The idea is to find the fundamental differences, the similarities, and the reasons why. What was going on in their day that they wrote the way they wrote? This is what criticism is. So many churches are so negative against the biblical scholarship, and it's absolutely unnecessary. The biblical scholarship is the most powerful, realistic, logical way. Now, of course, they can take it to excess, of course. Yes, there are several scholars who just completely blow it completely out of proportion, but it's kind of a... You know, in some respects, it's like science. It's kind of a self-correcting approach. The, uh, the overall scholarship of the Bible is really quite solid. And with the new discoveries, with our understandings of the early Christian sources, not only the early Christian fathers, but with the magnificent discoveries of some of the early and earliest Christian literatures that have now been found, we have a much better view, a much better understanding of earliest Christianity. And it's, it's an absolutely delightful situation. We almost have an overabundance of materials now that we can study the subject of the Bible in a realistic fashion. The churches, for the most part, 
as a general view, and I know it's dangerous to generalize. I'm well aware of this. I understand this. But still, this is how they do it. And Bart Ehrman shows this. They, they present a devotional, pious reading of the Bible. I mean, in a nutshell, that's the simplest way to put this. The scholars study the Bible from a historic point. There is no theological background that they feel they need to either defend or refute in order to make their interpretation correct. They're not interested in theology or doctrine. They're interested in studying what happened and why, how and by who. And they've developed methods for doing this. Now this is very important because the several churches are now saying that you have to beware of the wolves in sheep's clothing. I mean, they use all the scriptural allusions to label the biblical historians and biblical, you know, <laughs> these guys are heretics, they're liberals, etc. And then they feel that they can ignore their research. And this is unfortunate. This is truly unfortunate. So many of these biblical scholars are really seriously great Christians. Some of them aren't. Some of them are Jewish. The, the nationalities span across the world. Some of them are Japanese, some of them are American, some of them are Canadian, some of them are European, some of them are African, some of them are Mexican, South American, etc. This, this Bible study is a fascinating thing. Well, Paul on women. This is such an interesting topic. And I can't go through all my books. I overdo everything. I brought, you know, crap, I brought 35, 40 books. I am going to use just two books. And understand, this is not the only scholar who has said this. So, here's my idea on Paul telling you women to shut up and obey. Sit down and be quiet while we men teach the truth. And you women, all you have to do is obey. That's simply not Paul's teaching. It's a very interesting topic. Now then, this, uh, the interesting thing the uh, scholars have, the advantage that the biblical scholars have is, number one, the manuscript textual tradition. There's thousands of copies of manuscripts. Early on, they've noticed that the, uh, in the earlier from the earliest times on, when they began to write the oral tradition down, several, several years later, after Jesus' life was already over and done with, the manuscripts varied widely. There was an enormous amount of copying, and the rise of the professional scribe had not occurred yet. As time moved forward into the Byzantine era several centuries later, all of the texts were unified into one textual tradition. This is called the Byzantine era, the Byzantine family of manuscripts. It's very corrupt. It was sloppily done. They're not nearly as valuable to us as the earliest manuscripts were. And most of our Bible translations, including the King James from Erasmus and Tyndale and so on and so forth, came from these Byzantine manuscripts in the medieval ages. And now, Westcott and Hort, in the middle to late 1800s, and Tischendorf, he found that magnificent uh, Sinaiticus manuscript of the entire Bible, and uh, the monks in the monasteries were burning the leaves to give them heat. <laughs> oh, crap! And Tischendorf, through some what, what we probably shady methods, ended up getting that manuscript out of their hands before they destroyed it. Thank goodness! So anyway, and, and then in the Vatican, another huge document was discovered, the Vaticanus. So we have the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus. These are earlier manuscripts than the Byzantine manuscripts. They were written earlier. 
And so this, this biblical manuscript tradition is an extremely interesting subject. Well, you don't hear about this in church much. It's, it's a crying shame. We need to understand more about the reality of the Bible, what constitutes the Bible, etc. Anyway, with the manuscript tradition and with the use of the early manuscripts from the early church fathers, Tertullian, Oregon, Irenaeus, those people, Papias, Several of the traditions about the scriptures come from the early Christian fathers. The, the idea that we have discovered now, um, James Dunn is huge on this in his book, The Unity and Diversity of the New Testament, and I, and I have it with me in my truck. He shows that the, uh, the incredible amount of diversity of thought, of activity, of different kinds of beliefs in the earliest substratums of Christianity uh, is obvious. Now that we have the history coming out through the discoveries, well, we discovered the Nagamati Codices the same year the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. The Dead Sea Scrolls were the Jewish stuff, the Nagamati is the early Christian stuff. We now know there wasn't a single unified Christianity at all. The diversity, Elaine Pagels has noted, that the diversity of different groups of Christians who each had their own particular gospel, a group in Syria might have had the gospel of Luke, whereas the group way down in Jerusalem would have only had the gospel of Matthew, some churches over in Asia Minor only had Paul's letters. They didn't have any of the Gospels. So that each one of the different communities had different forms of beliefs, and the unification of the Bible itself, as well as the belief, didn't occur until, well, after four to five to six hundred years. Through the canonization process, the, the arguments against the heretics, you know, things like this, they... They argued, well, you don't believe what we believe, so you're a heretic. We are the true way. We teach the correct orthodox doctrine. You, you teach false doctrine. Your view of Christ isn't correct, therefore you're heretics. And these are the Jewish Christians fighting among themselves, damning and anathemizing and wiping out their opponents because they didn't believe like they did. And, and this, this history is well established, I promise. I'm, I'm not telling you anything new. <laughs> the scholarship on this is pretty immense. In the process, Bart Ehrman has shown probably the, uh, the, the best overall description of this phenomenon is Bart Ehrman's book, Forged. Harper One Books 2011, brand new. It's called Forged. He discusses the history, it's a, it's a you know, 300 page book, you can read it in a day. He discusses the history of because everyone was competing with everyone else and everyone was wanting to get their writings back to the apostolic eyewitnesses because this kind of gave it an authority over someone else's manuscript of written by someone who wasn't one of the witnesses to Jesus. So one of the criterion for important valid scripture was make sure it goes back to one of the apostles, preferably one of their writings. Well, because of that, of course, because there were so many dozens, I'm not exaggerating here, dozens of different ways of understanding Jesus what he did, what he said, what he meant, everyone was forging Gospels, letters of Paul, Gospels of Jesus, of James, of, of John, of Philip, of Andrew, of Mary, of Mary Magdalene. There were just all kinds of forgeries flying around, and everyone was claiming that theirs went back to the original apostles too, and they had the original teaching. I mean, I mean, it's in somewhat it's comical in some respects. They had to produce a forgery to teach the truth, <laughs> and everyone, the Orthodox as well as the non-Orthodox, the heretics was doing this. Some of those forgeries found their way into our New Testament. To make a long story short, I won't give you the history, Bart Ehrman book Forged, 
does. Very excellent read to give you the, the background that the forgeries were even denouncing other forgers. <laughs> it was an amazing thing. Everybody was damning everybody else with their forgeries in order to tell the truth. It's the oddest situation. It is so fascinating. Well, in, with this background, we can get into this discussion of Paul telling women, shut it up, sit it down, and learn. We will teach you. You, you don't interrupt us. We are the important leaders. You, you sit down, shut up, and obey. That's not what Paul taught. That was a, an attitude of a later day. And Bart Ehrman shows this very interestingly. Now, Ehrman, in another one of his books, misquoting Jesus, the story behind who changed the Bible and why. This is a Harper San Francisco book for 2007. I'm going to read quite a bit of this in this section on pages 178 through about 182 because he's giving us the context of the early Christian views and the scripture and the basis of the scripture and why we are misunderstanding some things. Debates over the role of the women didn't play an enormous role in the transmission of the texts of the New Testament, but they did play a little role. It's very interesting seeing the evidence in the manuscripts of this idea of women in the church. Modern scholars have come to recognize that the disputes over the role of women in the early church occurred precisely because women had a role. And that's why the disputes arose. Often a significant and a high publicly profiled role. Moreover, this was the case from the very beginning, starting with the ministry of Jesus himself. It's true that Jesus' closest followers, the twelve disciples, were all men, as we would expect of a Jewish teacher in the first century Palestine. But our earliest Gospels indicate that Jesus was also accompanied by women on his travels, and that some of these women provided for him and his disciples financially, serving as patrons for his itinerary preaching mission. We can read about this in Mark 15 and Luke 8. Jesus is said to have engaged in public dialogue with women and to have ministered to them in public, Mark 7 and John 4. In particular, we're told that women accompanied Jesus during his final trip to Jerusalem, that they were present at his crucifixion, and where they alone remained faithful to him until the very end when the male disciples had fled, Matthew 27, 55 and Mark 15, 40 and 41. Most significant of all, each of our Gospels indicates that it was women, Mary Magdalene alone, or with several companions, depending on which Gospel you read, who discovered his empty tomb, and so they were the first to know about and testify to Jesus' resurrection from the dead. You read about that in Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 23, and John 20. It is intriguing to ask, he says, he's on page 179 here, It is intriguing to ask what it was about Jesus' message that particularly attracted women. Now, most scholars remain convinced that Jesus proclaimed the coming of the kingdom of God in which there will be no more injustice, suffering, or evil, in which all of the people, rich and the poor, slave and the free, men and the women, would be on an equal footing. This obviously proves particularly attractive as a message of hope to those who in the present age were underprivileged. Mainly a lot of the women were, yes, and the slaves, the poor, the sick, the outcast, etc. In any event, we do not need to wait even until the second century, however, to see that women played a major role in the early Christian churches. We already get a clear sense of this from the earliest Christian writers whose works have survived, namely the Apostle Paul. Now, this is an interesting idea here. The Pauline letters of the New Testament provide ample evidence that women held a prominent place in the emerging Christian communities from the earliest of times. Were you aware of that? It's true. We might consider, for example, Paul's letters to the Romans, 
at the end of which he sends greetings to various members of the Roman congregation. That's in chapter 16. Although Paul names more men than women here, it is clear that women were seen in no way inferior to their male counterparts in the church. Paul mentions Phoebe, for example, who is a deacon in the church of Centre. I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right. Probably not. C-E-N-C-H-R-A or R-E-A-E. Wow. And Paul's own patron was this woman whom he entrusts with the task of carrying his letter to Rome. It's Romans 16, 1 and 2. And there is Prisca, who along with her husband, Aquila, is responsible for missionary work among the Gentiles and who supports a Christian congregation in her home. Notice that she is mentioned first ahead of her husband, Prisca, then Aquila. Then there is Mary, a colleague of Paul's who works among the Romans. Verse 6 there. There are also Tryphena, Tryphosa, and Persis, women whom Paul calls his co-workers in the gospel. And there are Julia and the mother of Rufus and the sister of Nereus, all of whom appear to have a high profile in the community. Most impressive of all, there is Junia, a woman whom Paul calls foremost among the apostles. Verse 7. The apostolic band was evidently larger than the list of twelve men with whom most people are familiar. Women, in short, appear to have played a significant role in the churches in Paul's day. So how do we find it that Paul is telling them not to participate in church? There's an answer. Jesus' message was rooted in the coming of the kingdom of God, and apparently this was Paul's message also. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, he says. This is in Galatians 3, 27-28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for all of you are one in Jesus Christ. Now, the equality in Christ may have manifested itself in the actual worship services, services of the Pauline communities. Rather than being silent hearers of the word, women appear to have been actively involved in the weekly fellowship meetings, participating, for example, by praying and prophesying, much as the men did. And we can read about that in 1 Corinthians 11, a genuine epistle of Paul, as the Romans are. At the same time, to modern interpreters, it may appear that Paul did not take his view of the relationship of men and women in Christ to what is thought as the logical conclusion. He did require, for example, that when women prayed and prophesied in church that they veil their heads, their heads are covered. In other words, Paul did not urge a social revolution in the relationship of men and women, just as he did not urge the abolition of slavery, even though he maintained that in Christ there is neither slave nor free. Instead, he insisted that since the time is short until the coming of the kingdom, and make no mistake about it, this Christian apocalyptic, now apocalyptic means the end of times, this Christian apocalyptic was the main message of Jesus. He said, the coming of the kingdom of God is going to happen, and there's many of you in this generation who will see it. Well, Paul, of course, felt he was in that generation. And so everything he taught and did is in relationship to this failed Christian apocalyptic. Jesus didn't come again. The kingdom never showed up. Social injustice just went right on marching around. It's been 2,000 years now. The kingdom of God never did show up. So the urgency of Paul is not to cause a social revolution. He's more or less saying, look, just accept the roles you have now until the kingdom comes, and then we're all going to be free anyway. We're not going to have any of this social injustice from the Roman Empire. Nobody else is going to rule over us except God in the kingdom of God. So... Some, in some churches, women played a very important leadership role. In other churches, their roles were diminished and their voices were quieted. Reading later documents associated with Paul's churches after his death, we can see that disputes arose about the roles of women. Eventually, there came an effort to suppress the role of women in the churches altogether, but not in Paul's day. Not in the earliest Christianity, you see. 
the documents in the New Testament that speak of women shutting up, sitting down, and being quiet, be hearers of the word only, is from a later time after the Christians realize, well, the kingdom of God isn't coming, so we had better put together a central church. We had better make sure the church has to survive. And so that's what they were attempting to do. And it was in those days, in the, in the epistles of Timothy, see the concern in the epistles of Timothy and Titus, the pastorals, that are considered to be modern, for, well not modern, but ancient forgeries in the name of Paul, None of that concern about church organization, what a bishop's supposed to do, what an apostle's role is, how the deacons function, you know, where do you meet, what scriptures do you read, how do you administer the sacrament and all that. None of that was Paul's concern. None of it. It was unnecessary. The kingdom was coming soon, in his day. The later dated documents, the pastoral letters, after they realized, well, it didn't happen the way they said it would, so we have to accommodate our reality with the facts, then those concerns arose in the second and third centuries. The New Testament did not just fall down, plop, total and complete in the lapse of the early Christians. It was eventually formed together and put all together over the course of many centuries. And that's critical to understand. In the genuine letters of Paul, we don't have this concern about women at all. Everyone was performing the work getting prepared for the kingdom to come. It was only in the later day that that issue became dominant. And it's an issue that is in Gospels, not Gospels, in writings in the New Testament that are not considered to be authentic Pauline writings. This is fascinating. In the area where Paul is describing the roles of women and men, trying to get them to all prophesy, it was a, it was a community where everybody had the gifts of the Spirit and everybody was edifying everybody else. Some of the manuscripts change some things. The later manuscripts change the teachings of Paul within his own letters. And Ehrman documents that. I'm not going to give you all the details, but if you can, misquoting Jesus, he has all the details in this. So, this is fascinating because what I wanted to say, oh, and he's discussing the evidence of the, the changing of the several manuscripts that shuffle verses around, and so they change the immediate literary context within 1 Corinthians as a whole. It appears, based on the manuscript evidence that we have now of the early biblical manuscripts, hundreds of them, but on the manuscript evidence, it appears that Paul did not write 1 Corinthians 14, 34, and 35. And uh, it's very interesting that Paul speaks of the woman Junia. He's saying this on page 185 of his book. He says, and a man who was presumably her husband, Andronicus, both of whom he calls foremost among the apostles. This is a significant verse because it is the only place in the New Testament in which a woman is referred to as an apostle. You see, they were not separate, different, submissive, meek followers of proper priesthood lines of authority at all. They were the priesthood. Everybody had it, and everybody was using it, because the kingdom of God was coming, and they had to have maximum preparation. This is fascinating. This is the Paul's view of men and women. Equals working toward the kingdom. This is the proper view. Anyway, oh, and the manuscripts... This is interesting. The later dated biblical manuscripts, because they, they became, in the 2nd and 3rd and 4th centuries, they became concerned about women being apostles. They changed the manuscripts to say that Junia, a woman's name, was actually Junius. They added an S so that it became a man. <laughs> Isn't that fascinating? And we have the manuscript evidence. 
This is so fascinating. There is no evidence, however, in the ancient world for Junius as a man's name. Paul is referring to a woman named Junia. Even though in some modern English Bibles, check your own in fact, translators continue to refer to this female apostle as if she were a man named Junius. The earliest manuscripts definitely identify her as a woman. The later corrupt manuscripts turned her into a man, because that was the later concern. Paul didn't do any of that kind of chicancery and shenanigans. Not at all. Anyway, with this textual change, no longer does one need to worry about a woman being cited among the apostolic band of men. See, that's for a later age. That was not Paul's thinking. The idea of women being prominent, let alone prominent converters, was just too much for some of the later scribes. And so the text came to be changed in some manuscripts. Uh, oh, it's very interesting that in, in one of the sections, the women were being converted along with the men, and the manuscripts changed it so that now it is the men who are prominent and not their wives who converted. The women were converting people in the earliest manuscripts. And the later scribes changed that to show that the women were just the wives. It was the men who was doing the converting. <laughs> you see the change there. But that wasn't Paul's view. So it's not proper to condemn Paul. Paul's innocent of this kind of crap. It is the later times after the Christians recognized, well, the kingdom of God didn't show up after all. It was the later times that they began to change the roles of men and women. This is interesting. Among Paul's companions in the book of Acts were a husband and wife named Aquila and Priscilla. Sometimes when they are mentioned, the author gives the wife's name first as if she was some kind of special prominence, either in the relationship or in the Christian mission, as happens in Romans 16.3 as well, where she is called Prisca. Not surprisingly, scribes occasionally took umbrage at this sequence and reversed it so that the man was given his due by having his name mentioned first, Aquila and Priscilla, rather than Priscilla and Aquila. In short, he says this on page 186, there were debates in the early centuries of the church over the role of women. And on occasion, these debates spilled over into the textual transmission of the New Testament itself as scribes sometimes changed their texts in order to make them coincide more closely with the scribes' own sense of the limited role of women in the church. And the reason this is so important is because we see this happening not only concerning the role of women, but we see it happening concerning doctrines, various interpretations of Jesus, various interpretations of what Paul meant, various interpretations of the relationship of the early apostles group based on the idea of what is the resurrection. We find this relationship of knowledge of who was who, who did what, who said what, and who meant what constantly going on in an argumentative dialectic between hundreds of different groups of different kinds of Jewish Christians, of Christians as Christianity split from Judaism through the centuries, etc. And eventually, because Constantine empowered the original heretics with political power, then those heretics became the orthodoxy and they, in turn, stamped out everybody else who disagreed with them, and they labeled them the heretics, and then they rewrote the history. That is what Eusebius' church history is. They rewrote the history of Christianity, trying to demonstrate that, well, see, originally, this was the actual teaching from the very first. And everybody has agreed with our teaching. <laughs> 
But they didn't get that fully put over because now in our day, now that more and more discoveries are being found of the manuscripts and the various books of other Christian groups are discovered, we see the incredible variety, the incredible arguments. We have dozens of forgeries today that the scholars have identified, and we can compare and cross-reference and cross-check the forgeries with the real thing, if there is such a thing as the real thing, and we find that the heretics who became orthodox were actually the ones who controlled what the Bible New Testament canon became. It's not the original thinking at all. It is the writings of those who won the wars in early Christianity. What we have is interpretations. That's what the New Testament is. It's all interpretation from someone other's viewpoint. Chew on that for a while, won't you?